Hello, happy Monday. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Guman Singh. In our top story, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals provided an opinion that the 32nd legislature of the VI determined the eligibility of Kevin Rodriguez for membership in the legislature. This sentiment was shared by the minority caucus and recently Senator Jeanette Millen Young, who is part of that caucus, stated publicly that in order for legislature to judge the merits of Rodriguez, the senator-elect must be sworn in first and that any action taken regarding his status as individual and not a senator would be invalid. News to Stephanie Brown reports. Tomorrow, June 27th, members of the 32nd legislature will convene in a session to judge qualifications of Senator-elect Kevin Rodriguez to serve in the 32nd legislature. General K. Saro is slated to provide testimony at the legislative session. Saro is the mathematical winner of the April 8th elections, which to this date has not been certified. Shortly after the November 2016 general elections, Saro, that ran eighth place, filed a preliminary injunction stopping Rodriguez from taking oath with other members of the 32nd legislature. In a Supreme Court document, Saro informed that she received an anonymous email containing a portion of a bankruptcy petition that Rodriguez filed in Tennessee. The Board of Election, the Department of Justice, and the legislature ping-ponged the responsibility of sorting out the precedent in matter. Senator-elect Kevin Rodriguez, uh, the legislature was sued in the district court for not seating Senator-elect Kevin Rodriguez. No, he is not a member of the, he, he is uh, precluded from being a member of the 32nd legislature because of his filings in bankruptcy court in, in Tennessee. Rodriguez sued the 32nd legislature, stating that the legislative body was the only entity to rule in his case to take a seat as a senator and several individuals, including the St. Thomas Democratic Chair, attested that Rodriguez worked in the Virgin Islands uh, boy, and was no, a bona fide uh, resident. It's, it's been a a residence here in the territory. He's worked with me. I've testified. Minority members attested that the situation be handled by the legislature and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals also shared the opinion. For News 2, I'm Stephanie Shalana Brown. Senator Millen Young also made remarks that a committee on ethics can be created to review Senator-elect Kevin Rodriguez's eligibility. The legislative session, however, will convene tomorrow. Count on two to keep you updated. Governor Kenneth Mapp has approved a bill which authorizes the government to purchase parcels required for the start of construction of Phase 2 of the Frederickstead Economic Revitalization Project, the Polly Joseph Stadium, the Terrence Martin softball field and surrounds, and amount not to exceed $480,000 from the Community Facilities Trust account and or the St. Croix Capital Improvement Fund. The governor has also approved a measure that reprograms funds from the Community Facilities Trust account for renovations at the current terrace, Joseph Albain and Emil Griffith Ballparks on St. Thomas. Governor Mapp has also approved a bill increasing the current fiscal year appropriation for the Department of Human Services while approving appropriations for needed repairs and infrastructure improvements at the territory's two hospitals. MAP has vetoed sections of the bills. He specifically objects to the Senate's omission of fund funding to increase salaries for registered nurses at the 1F Louis Hospital, while specifically providing funding for nurses' salaries at the Schneider Regional Medical Center. The governor further noted that salary levels for registered nurses at the hospitals are set by collective bargaining agreements and not legislative appropriations. Creation. Governor Mapp has also vetoed a bill which would have amended the public employee grievance process to eliminate the government employee services commissions from any uh, procedures. He strongly objects to a section of the bill which strips the police commissioner of the authority to uh, suspend temporarily an employee who engages in misconduct. While agreeing with the Senate's effort to restructure the GESC, Governor Mapp is requesting that lawmakers correct what he regards as an ill-advised restriction of the police commissioner's authority. Well, despite tack at a bank bankruptcy, the AG continues to urge car owners to repair defective airbags and to hold Takata accountable. Attorney General Claude Walker has uh, vowed to continue seeking relief for the Virgin Islands consumers affected by the Takata airbags. And you may remember in May 2016, the DOJ 
filed a complaint and motion for a preliminary injunction against Takata, which manufactured and sold dangerous airbags that were installed in Toyota, Nissan, Ford, and Honda vehicles. The case has been on hold, awaiting initial de decision from the court on whether the government may proceed. Well, on June 19th, the parties appeared before VI Superior Court Judge Michael Dunstan for an emergency hearing during which the government asked the court to impose a preliminary injunction against Takata, which filed for bankruptcy today, and ordered the company to set aside a sum of money in escrow to be awarded to Virgin Islands consumers impacted by the faulty airbags. Well, the court requested and was provided with further evidence regarding the methodology the court should employ in the calculation of sum for court escrow, as well as the irreparable harm factor of the preliminary injunction balancing test. Following the government's emergency request for expedited ruling on its motion for preliminary injunction and supplemental evidence and information, uh, and after reports from various sources that Takata Corp and TK Holdings will file for bankruptcy, today Judge Dunson handed down his ruling ordering Takata Corporation and TK Holdings to set aside more than $8 million for Virgin Islands consumers affected by Takata airbags nationwide. More than 100 Takata airbags have exploded violently, sending shrapnel throughout the vehicles. One such incident occurred on St. Croix. At least 10 deaths have occurred in the uh, U.S. And Takata airbags develop problems most quickly in areas with high humidity and high temperatures, like the Virgin Islands' A.T. Walker said. We'll turn into some crime reports. Police say on Sunday, June 25th, at approximately 11.23 p.m., officers from the Richard Callwood Command traveled to the area of Estate Lurkin Lund in reference to a gunshot victim. Upon arrival to the scene, officers observed an unresponsive black male with what appeared to be multiple gunshot wounds about his body. The male was pronounced dead on the scene by medical attendants and was identified by his next of kin as Vatscott David. 22 years old. Any persons having information regarding this incident, you're asked to contact Major Crime Unit or uh, 911 Crime Stoppers or the Chief's Office. On June 22nd at approximately 6.40 p.m., the 911 Emergency Call Center received a call from the 1F Louis Hospital in reference to a gunshot victim. Officers arrived and preliminary investigations revealed that a black male individual walked into the hospital with a gunshot wound to his face. He was unable to give investigators a statement due to his injuries he sustained. He has been recently airlifted for further medical treatment. The incident took place at the Secret Bar in Estate Grove Place. Also on Friday, June 23rd at approximately 8.01 a.m., the major crime unit was dispatched to Sapphire Beach Resort, uh, Barbados building in relative to an uh, unresponsive female. And uh, a white female was observed when officers re arrived lying on a blow-up bed on the floor wearing a multicolor outfit. The victim was examined by EMTs who discovered she had no vital signs. The deceased uh, next of kin has not been notified. She was 55 years of age. It was reported that the victim suffered from sleep apnea. Now, these cases are presently under investigation by the major crime unit. A suspected gunman has turned himself in. Here is more from the VIPD. 25th at approximately 6.03 p.m., a police sergeant on patrol heard a discharging of shots in the vicinity of Wimball Park. The officer notified the 911 emergency call center in reference to the shooting. Upon making an observation of the area, the sergeant found a black male individual with multiple gunshot wound about the body. The victim was transported to the Wong F. Louis Hospital by ambulance for treatment. Police identified the suspect as 36-year-old Nathaniel Ninja Hazel of a state whim. Hazel surrendered to the police at 10.45 p.m. on Sunday, June 25th. Hazel was arrested and charged for assault first, unauthorized possession of a firearm, and other gun-related charges. In keeping our eye on the economy, let's take a look at the stock market watch with the New York Stock Exchange. According to the numbers, we can see the Dow up 14, NASDAQ down 18, S&P 500 up. Coming up on News 2, we have much more straight ahead. We'll be right back.
life coming up shortly. Meanwhile, a President Trump getting good news from the Supreme Court Monday as the court agreed to hear oral arguments in the fall for the president's travel ban and also allowing a partial version of the ban to take effect. President Trump saying in a statement, today's unanimous Supreme Court decision is a clear victory for our national security. It allows the travel suspension for the six terror-prone country and the refugee suspension to become largely effective. The court's ruling means that people from the six impacted countries who have bona fide relationships here in the U.S. may enter, like family members in the U.S., university students, and those with U.S. job offers. The revised version of the travel ban was signed by the president in March, covering six countries, Iran, Syria, Libya, Sudan, Yemen, and Somalia. Iraq was dropped from the original executive order that was put forward in January. It was blocked in federal courts before it could take effect. Well, some work is almost complete at the Western Cemetery, and it involves removing trees that are deemed dangerous. We shared it with you last week due to falling limbs to the cemetery's visitors. Agriculture Commissioner Carlos Robles has been working with the Public Works to address that threat. Here's more. Attended funerals here for a number of years, have been here at times when the branches fall in the middle of the event, and we knew that that could potentially be a hazard and as an arborist myself I know the potential challenges that could create and so we partnered with the St. Thomas St. John Administrator and Public Works to see how we could tackle this problem immediately before it creates a hazardous situation for our community and a liability for the government. We got in a professional tree climber to actually bring these trees down uh, professionally because just cutting a tree down, they could be damaging the tombs as well as people coming in and visiting the loved ones in, uh, in the cemetery. And by the end of this week, they'll be removed. The fear we had is them snapping, the branches snapping and hitting people, falling on people while they were visiting or at a funeral or even falling on the vaults and destroying the vaults. So um, we jumped to it immediately. And we are just about at the end of the road. Thank you very much. Well, the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, they're scheduling a town hall meeting on St. Croix and St. Thomas. The department is encouraging the recreational fishing community to attend the meetings to hear about the status of recreational fishing. Training for recording catch data will also be provided. Further updates about improvements for boat ramps and docks will be shared. And the department will be accepting input for future projects. That's on St. Thomas, Tuesday, June 27th. The meeting will occur at the Windward Passage Hotel between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. On St. Croix, the meeting will be held the following day, June 28th, at Via Morales Restaurant in Wim between 7 to 9 p.m. 16th annual Relay for Life was held this past weekend at the Adelita Cancrine Junior High School Field from 4 p.m. on Saturday to June 24th, uh, June 25th, rather, on Sunday, and it ended at 11 a.m. Now, they remind you that no one is immune to cancer, but there's always hope, which stems from your generosity and support of the mission of the American Cancer Society. Every dollar raised in the territory stays in the territory, and it's used to give direct financial assistance to newly diagnosed cancer patients. There was a luminary ceremony held in the evening with candles lit in remembrance of those who lost their battle against cancer and to honor those who have survived. We had many uh, participants, including the Bambula dancers you saw a little earlier there. Survivors made a special lap around the field as caregivers, volunteers, family and friends support and encourage them in their symbolic journey. There was also a survivor's dinner with meals provided by the Marriott's Frenchman's Reef. Be sure to count on two. We will share uh, the amount of funds raised as we speak to Ms. Le Lisa Aqui of the American Cancer Society. St. Croix residents marched the streets of Christiansted from Basin Triangle to the pavilion and the waterfront last week for World Sickle Cell Day. Prayers, poems, testimonies, remarks, and educational information about the genetic disorder was uh, shared with those present. Now, Governor Kenneth Mapp shared his personal story dealing with sickle cell. He said, I made up my mind at the age of 11 that I was not going to live with sickle cell. He said, sickle cell had to live with me.
You have to manage yourself, know yourself, know your physical conditions, and be able to do the things that you know you must do that will give you a long quality of life, he said. The candlelight march and rally was organized by the Virgin Island Sickle Cell Foundation Parent Support Group to celebrate and bring sickle cell awareness to the community at large. Marches included Governor Mapp, St. Croix Administrator Stephanie Williams, various government officials, and uh, many supporters. Mark this on your calendar. HIV testing day is tomorrow, Tuesday, June 27th, and the Department of Health will be hosting free HIV testing, and there are a few sites set up in recognition of National HIV Testing Day. These areas are on St. Croix at the Sunny Isle Shopping Center from 10 to 3, and then St. Thomas at Emancipation Garden from 11 to 3. Here's more. HIV, known as the human immunodeficiency virus, is a virus that causes AIDS. The only way to know if you have HIV is to get tested. Many people with HIV do not exhibit any symptoms, and studies have shown that one in eight people living with HIV are not aware that they even have it. Even if you don't feel sick, getting early detection and treatment for HIV is important. Well, a violence prevention summit, youth violence prevention summit is coming up, is getting underway at UVI on Tuesday, June 27 on St. Croix and on Wednesday, June 28 on St. Thomas at both UVI campuses. Here's more on what is planned. We have certain guest presenters, uh, Dr. Brooke Bello, she is the CEO and founder of More to Life Incorporated. And she will be uh, pretty much addressing the issue of human trafficking, anti-trafficking youth crime prevention and its root causes. Register online at csap.uvi.edu. CSAP is C-S-A-P, as in Paul, at uvi.edu. It's a $35 registration fee, and anyone from teachers to parents to administrators, um, law enforcement and probation officers uh, youth advocates are welcome to attend this summit. Um, Dr. Bella provides a curriculum actually for uh, the 6th to 12th grade and she also has a college curriculum that um, helps to address the root cause and also to provide solutions and strategies to this issue that we're so suffering from here in the territory. We're losing our youths rapidly and that loss needs to shift. Because if this pattern continues, then what would be left? Who is going to be here to really, you know, become the leaders of tomorrow? Thanks for that, Dr. Karam. Well, St. John Festival is in full swing, and we want to say kudos this week. And Gemini Niles won the title of Miss St. John Festival Queen. She also captured Miss Cooperative, Miss Photogenic, Best International Wear, Costumes, Best Talent, and Best Evening Wear. The other beauties that displayed culture and elegance gave attendees a great show. Let's see, Pazé Harrigan was the first runner-up, and she also won Miss Intellect. Daniela Joseph won Miss Congeniality, and Janicia Jackson was also a participant in the Festival Queen show. Be sure we'll hear from the Festival Committee and share some pictures as soon as we get them. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next. We take a look here across the Atlantic. You can see how uh, there's not really much showing up at all here on satellite imagery. We have a wave that had pushed to our west, and now it's uh, affecting the Dominican Republic and also into Haiti. But into our area, things looking pretty quiet. We do have a wave that is going to be moving across to our south, and that is going to be occurring uh, for the late week. And so that could bring an uptick in showers at that time. But at this time, you can see how things generally pretty quiet. There's a little bit of cloud, a little bit of shower uh, estimated radar there. Taking a look here across Puerto Rico, you can see how things looking very quiet there. Now for tonight, we have mainly clear skies, a temperature of 82 degrees. And as we go into tomorrow, we'll have sunshine around in St. John, 92 degrees, maybe just a brief uh, isolated shower around in St. John's or in St. 
Thomas, but in general, we're looking at pretty quiet conditions. 92 degrees for St. Thomas for tomorrow. St. Croix, mostly sunny skies with a temperature of 89 degrees for tomorrow. The waves uh, are going to be at two to four feet on the Atlantic side. We have winds out of the east, 10 to 15 knots. On the Caribbean side, same thing, two to four feet are our waves and the winds are out of the east at 10 to 15 knots. Looking through the forecast then for your Wednesday, a shower again, only spotty, so there's not much going on, a high temperature of 92 degrees. By Wednesday and Thursday, excuse me, by Thursday and Friday, that's when we're going to see that wave crossing just to our south, so it doesn't come directly across the uh, Virgin Islands, but it's co close enough to sideswipe us, bring us a couple of spotty showers on Thursday and Friday, and then on Saturday, only a brief shower or two in the area with a high temperature of 91. Sandy. Thank you. Our new Sioux weather picture there, Destiny King, seventh grader of Niski Moravian School, sharing this beautiful picture with a nice bright rainbow sunshine and some showers here and there, which we always welcome. Destiny, thank you for this nice colorful addition. Send us your new Sioux weather picture to the address right there on the screen and tune in to see it. Be sure to stick around. New Sioux Sports comes your way next. I'm Gary Anthony and this is News 2 Sports. If it's late June, then it must be baseball season and it must be in full swing. Yeah, bad pun intended. The Virgin Islands Little League District Championship was held this weekend at Griffith Park in St. Thomas, featuring St. Thomas versus St. Croix All-Stars from age groups 11 to 12 and 9 to 10, battling it out. Before Friday's games, the Virgin Islands Little League was presented with a check from VIA for over $10,000 as part of the pitch-in program. For every person who purchased high-speed data from October 2016 to May 31st of this year, $2 were donated and VIA matched every donation. At the beginning of the season, while we were still innovative and choice, they came to me and said, we're going to do a pitch-in campaign. And with that pitch-in campaign, they were going to donate $2. $2 for everything that they got into and give it back to the league and then match those funds. Uh, we did a program, it was a new program, an affinity program for Little League, which we have supported for the last 30 years. People were happy to participate, happy to be involved in the giving process, and we were able to give between what they gave and what we matched, $10,400. So we're here tonight, and it's, it's just been incredible because Everyone was able to be involved in the process. It wasn't just via writing a check. It was the whole community participating. So we're very happy about that. On the diamond, the St. Thomas All-Stars from both age groups swept the best of three series. The 11 to 12s now go to St. John Antigua for the Little League Caribbean Championship from July 7th to July 14th. The 9 to 10 All-Stars will travel to Fajardo, Puerto Rico for the America Caribbean Regional Championships July 28th through August 7th. Sticking with the Little League, the 5070 Intermediate Little League Latin America Regional Tournament is rounding second in Reynosa, Mexico. The VI team is currently 1-1. One one. They lost 10-0 to Curacao on Friday, then they beat Colombia 9-2 on Sunday. Today they face El Salvador, who is 1-1. One one. From the bases to the links, the PGA Travelers Championship and it's down to a playoff hole between Jordan Spieth and Daniel Berger both tied at 12 under. Now check out speed from the bunker and it's in the hole. Last chance for Berger, just a bit outside and speed wins. Here's that shot again. And check out the chest bump. Who says golf isn't a contact sport? That's it for sports. Sandy, back to you. Thank you for that, Gary, and all the best to our little leaguers. Job well done. They make us proud. Thanks, Gary. That, that is all for this edition of News 2. We'd like to thank you for joining us for all the latest in news, weather, and sports. I'm Sandra Glamansing. Have a wonderful evening.